Are you ready? I'm ready. I love you. I love you too. You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button on our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for October 5th, 2018. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where you'll find us between now and the election, knocking doors, phone banking, mailing postcards, and swearing at the TV, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. That's right. And, uh, and, and, and hauling water. Hauling water, you. absolutely, every day. Every day. Uh, and postcards every day. Yep. And I'm, I've done 20 for Phil Bredesen. And I, it's not so much that I want Phil Bredesen in Tennessee to win the Senate as I want Marsha Blackburn to yeah. lose and get zero votes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, he is a conservative, and that's, uh, you know, I've been back and forth with a woman on Twitter who's also doing postcards for him. And he said something to the effect of words of support for Kavanaugh. And, you know, she said, I just did all these postcards for him. How could he? And I said, he's trying to win. <laughs> Right. And uh, he's going to deprive Marsha Blackburn of anything she can make an ad about. Indeed. So uh, that's his job right now. And he's not voting in the Senate. You know, uh, if Joe Manchin votes for Kavanaugh tomorrow, primary his ass. Right. Primary. If Phil Bresden votes what, when he's a senator, votes in favor of a douchebag Trump appointee. Mm-hmm. Something primary like, something is that. Primary. Yeah, primary. Yeah. And I'm not saying don't anticipate that, but you can guarantee that Marsha Blackburn's going to vote for the Trump agenda. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean, and you know, and, one of my beefs with the never Trumpers, mm-hmm. group of, you know, of, of profoundly overpaid refugees from their own catastrophe looking for, for a seat on my lifeboat are the ones who say, I don't know if I'm going to vote Democratic because, you know, I'm not Democrat. <laughs> I won't get I my tax cut. I don't agree yeah. with that. And Rick Wilson, I don't know that I'll vote for Democrats. I just don't. I don't know about that. I'm just not a Republican anymore. I just, no, fuck you. I don't care if yeah, you man. hate every Democrat on the ticket. Vote for them because they're the ones who aren't the party of Trump. Right. And I, I therefore, I really can't quibble with people four states away from me who are faced with a terrible choice because their voting public are basically shitty people who can't muster up enough liberal gumption to nominate an actual FDR or Truman or Obama Democrat. Yeah. So you're stuck with what you got. I mean, you know, I, I, I will one day do an entire 16 hour, one continuous sentence podcast <laughs> on, the, on the corruption of Illinois politics, yeah. especially yeah. the democratic party. I'll go all the way back to big bill Thompson. If you'd like the last Republican mayor of Chicago, but Politics is what you have. It's what it's not what you wish you had. What Mm -hmm. we wish we had is how we got fucking Trump. Because all of these clowns, starting from Matthew Dowd on down, said, well, it doesn't really matter what I say. You know, both sides are bad. Both sides are terrible. But her emails, blah, blah, blah. And guess what? It actually did matter. You know, it's a horse race. And one horse is marginally better than the other. And that's what you get. You don't, Except you, one horse in that case was tremendously better than yes, the exactly. other. And, it's always uh, a horse race. It's but we had to make race. it. We had to reduce the Democratic candidate to butter emails right. in order to have a horse race. Yeah. Right. And that's the uh, job of the media, to make everything a contest uh, between co-equals that right. is going to be settled by the 2% of the independents that they happen to personally know who live in the Beltway. Right. Yeah. Right. And so these, this news that we heard yesterday about... This poll, this NPR poll, showing increased enthusiasm for the election from Republicans. Well, they smell a win with Kavanaugh, and so they're coming out of their hidey hole mm-hmm. where they were independents to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Republican. Yeah. Love love that Brent Carbon Arbor. He's my guy. I love that man. I love loved him since the I love him. He was the lead singer for the Elevator Screamers in the 70s, wasn't he? I'm pretty sure he was. Love that band. And, and here's the thing. It does galvanize them. In exactly the same way that the Civil Rights Act galvanized white supremacists and Klansmen. Exactly. Yeah. But why are you proud of that? Of yeah. course, it's going to make them react that way. They're horrible, racist assholes. That's how they, this is what gets them off. 
What will stop them from doing that is beating them to their knees electorally and keeping them the w- there until they die off of natural causes. That's the yeah. only way to stop them. <laughs> so I don't care how happy they are. These, these are the shitholes who were thrilled with George Bush right up until George Bush started losing. Right. And that's when right. they all discovered they're either independent and became tea parties and suddenly they'd never heard of George Bush before. So, yeah, okay. Kurt Eichenwald tweeted today that he was speaking to a guy who was raging about opponents of Kavanaugh being un-American, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hoping for a normal conversation, I asked him his thoughts about Joan Larson. He called her a lying whore, unquote. (laughs) I was shocked. I told him, Joan Larson is a federal judge on Trump's Supreme Court list. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he stormed off. Now... Then his second tweet is, some of the folks reacting to this are saying this is a consequence of the man being uneducated. Nope. College and grad school, very well off, but a massive Fox News fan. I'm sure that he thought Joan, that Kurt Eichenwald was talking about Joan Walsh. Sure. Or Joan somebody. It doesn't, Joan of Arc. It doesn't matter who. (laughs) Some woman. She's a giant whore because she, she, her name came out of your libtard mouth. Right. Right. And that's all that I need. I, you know, I tell you the, the. One of my most regular wingnut correspondents yeah. Um, yeah. lectured me on what a lefty liberal, lefty loony Peggy Noonan was because one day she <laughs> said something mean about Sarah Palin. Right. And I said, Our, and then I recited back to him her entire history. And he's like, oh, well, you know, just thought she was liberal because of, of this thing. Well, let's talk about sports. Right. Right. And, you know, oh, and you know what, Blue Gal? That turned him right around. <laughs> no, it didn't. He was a Democrat way. after that? <laughs> yeah, no, fuck that. <laughs> they never, ever stopped being this way. Ever. That's the thing. That's the thing that is most offensive and shocking to our liberal sensibilities. That it yeah. doesn't matter how many times you prove them wrong. It doesn't. There's no place in their armor to stick a crowbar and pry them loose of this craziness. They're never going to change. And once you start getting it through your head that they're never going to change, and the news media is never going to stop playing the both sides game, yeah. you start contemplating different choices in the way you approach politics yeah who your enemies really are and who the enablers really are and why they're doing the shit they're doing because it's clearly not for the good of the country all right you're giving me an opportunity to brag about youngest child now please go ahead because uh you know what be be discreet honey (laughs) that's one of her (laughs) vocabulary words this week you're discreet and you for not euphoric you um, enthralling. Enthralling, yes. Yeah. She she has vocabulary words that she has to learn in her honors literature class every week. Yeah. And her teacher, God bless her public school, high school, freshman honors yeah. English teacher for being a tough old bird who doesn't do extra credit, who doesn't oh. care how charming you are. She wants you care. to do the work. Do the work. <laughs> And uh, youngest child is somewhat resistant to that because she has gotten by on her pleasant, charming nature for right. a long time with teachers. And she's smart, and she's smart. And she, she is smart. Her way through. She is know. smart, but but she has gotten through. I would say she got through middle school on her charm. I, yeah. she she did nice work and stayed organized and was a very compliant, pleasant, cooperative student. And mm-hmm. teachers love that, and that's great. But, and she helped the youngers, and she's a yes, math whiz. And she's a math. She's a she's a natural math whiz. But yeah. uh, you know, you can get by a lot in middle school with just being a good good student in terms of behavior. So, uh, but here's <laughs> here's the deal. I said something to her. I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but I read something to her on Twitter about Republicans, and she just looked at me and she said, "Those people are brainwashed, Ma." <laughs> And, and 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 I said she she has asked me before you know what's what's the greatest part part about being a parent she asked deep questions like that I said when you as a child uh, express something or do something that is completely free of me like you just come out with it come out right. with truth come out with some assertion that you clearly got on your own that to Complex me is, yeah the the, the, the the tree went into bloom you know that is amazing mm-hmm. to me. And wonderful. But uh, you mentioned how, you know, no matter how wrong they are, how, no matter well, how wrong it ha- it happens to be. In, in I want to add one world. parenting yeah. fail, if I yeah. may. Oh, what? Uh, the same youngest <laughs> child said, I don't want to read the Martian Chronicles. 
<laughs> she did. <laughs> yeah. So I'm screwing up somehow. I no. somehow, some way. She said, I got to read the Martian Chronicles. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I got, I got work to do. That's all I'm saying. That's oh, it. Gosh. Some, some personal work I have to well, do. On my I own. think we got, we both got her in telling her it was a wonderful book with a surprise ending and that. And read it like maybe. it's poetry. Yeah. And read it like it's poetry. Uh, but today so she texted me, uh, because I kind of insisted that she bring her vocabulary downstairs from her bedroom where her she's on her phone all the time, you know, bring your vocabulary downstairs. Let's discuss it. Read them out loud to me. Let's put them in a sentence. I'll, I'll act them out. You act one out. I'll act one out. And they're, you know, $10 words. Uh, mm -hmm. What haggard is one of them. <laughs> so that was an easy one this week to act out. I'm haggard. Uh, but but she had to learn these 12 words and, and use them in a sentence and know what part of speech they were and be able to define and spell them. And I told, and she's been struggling because <laughs> she, had, I, this is, this is total bragging and I know it and I'm not being humble here. She's mad because she has straight A's except for this honors literature class. And it's One killing her. Class. It's killing her. Because she wants to be a writer and she wants to go into a writing program and having, you know, you can't have a B minus an honest literature mom and be a writer. You might as well just throw your whole life away, right? It's over. Game <laughs> over, man. Game over. But I told her, you know, these vocabulary tests she has every week. I said, look, it is just a matter of memorizing. It's just a matter of do the work. Right. Recognize you need to do it. Do it. <laughs> Read them over, study, 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 and you'll go in and sail through. And then that bumps up your grade a lot. You know, every week oh, you get 100 on those, on those tests that are just a matter of memorizing the words. Mm -hmm. And so we worked last night together. After, I, like after, after I did my postcards to voters. <laughs> right. Grind, do the work. Just yeah. Do the work. Yeah, just do the work. And anyway, she texted me to say that she'd aced her test. So that right. that's the point. But she... It is a learning experience, and she has gained new information about how to succeed. Mm -hmm. And there are some people out there, and we know how they vote, mm -hmm. uh, who get enthusiastic when it looks like Trump's going to have a win, right? Yay. Yay. Here's a $10 word. Uneducable. <laughs> How's that? Use it in a sentence. That fucker is uneducable. <laughs> Don't waste I don't, your time. I don't, don't think, waste that, your time. I don't don't think waste he's going to put that sentence on the wall over at the high school. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. But if you are such a person <laughs> or you know such a person, yeah. our sponsor this week, Hello Fascist. Oh, yeah. Got a really big boost from, from our personal friend, the cyborg sent from the future to destroy America, Hugh Hewitt. Yeah, and they have a new said, product out too, right? They do. Oh, they good. do. Okay. It's, uh, it's elevator BLTs. Um Elevator special, you know, they, they're stacked like an elevator. They go up and down like an elevator and they're easy to eat and run away with in your hand. Like, uh, like, and they'll deliver to the elevator, the BLT. Um, yeah, and, and pass them it. over the screaming rape victim who is yeah. really, really mad at you. And, and righteously so. Yes. Because Hugh Hewitt, who said in a powerfully insane column oh in the God. Washington Post, where he has a column for some reason, um, said that confronting powerful Republicans in public uh, is literally just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the purge. Um, you mean the movie uh, series, the purge, the movie, the movie like the purge. setting fire to the street, yeah, the purge. Oh, okay. It's two minutes away from liberals in the streets with guns screaming, "Attica, Attica!" You know, it's just so it's, actually it's walking up to Jeff Flake and saying, "Listen to yeah. me and look at me when I'm talking to you." Is the purge? <laughs> yeah, he, he said. Well, you know. Uh, people who, who compare cold wars to what we have now or don't know what they're talking about, blah, blah, blah. It's not reached that level of violence. And then ominously a sentence all with of one word yet. <laughs> and then, you know, because who who is more trustworthy than a cyborg literally sent from the future to literally destroy America? Good um, Lord. So if you're one of those people who r routinely does horrible things, you should definitely not be eating out because that's where they get you. Instead, let the good people at Hello Fascist provide you with a fresh home cooked meals with no planning, no shopping, and no one calling you out on your moral depravity in public. That's the last part's so important. So this week's special is Elevator BLTs, Hello Fascist, because those people are definitely peeing in your food. Yeah, yeah, you want to eat are. at home. You do. Anyway... Let's talk about this week. Well, I love I love what you put in our podcast notes because this week 
has been very personal for women and and I'm a woman. Yes. And so folks, Drift Glass just put in the podcast notes Blue Gal Talks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cuz he didn't that's really not prescribing anything. Just Blue Gal, what do you want to say about this? Nope. Go ahead. I got I got a lot of stuff to say about things that are much less relevant than yeah. than that stuff. So why don't I just, you know, do what I do when you're talking about anything. I kick back, have a beer, <laughs> make it up. Yeah, put, that sound I hear is you c- cracking open a put, beer. You put, know? The, put the watch podcast, listen to some boys talking about NBA shit, you know. See, beer, there you go. Beer, there you like, go. I understand body. Well, good at that. Well, no, you're you're very good to me and good for me. And uh I know I know that you get it. Mm-hmm. Uh I was uh impressed with how uh, an author at Axios uh, used Slack to discuss this whole issue with all of the women in his office, uh, uh, published it totally protecting their anonymity, uh, and really gave a cross-section of what women are feeling and f- using the using the women in his office as a source uh, and, and did it very well, I thought. He he wrote. Um, I got. I should know who wrote this here. Excuse, I'm sorry about that. Uh-huh. Um, oh, excuse me. It's a woman, Kim Hart. Yeah. So it was a woman who did this. <laughs> of course. Suddenly, things, the, <laughs> Suddenly, I should have known that. Yeah, the, the angle on things changes just a little bit. Yeah, that's why. That's why she was able to do this so well. Uh, she and she really did protect uh, the sources. Um, but but this sentence really got me. Many of the women in my office told me, "quote." They were rattled by Christine Ford's testimony because it took them back to that party. Mm -hmm. It reminded them of that guy. They see their own stories in hers. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you were sexually assaulted at that party or not by that guy or you knew that guy and you didn't have any interaction with him. You just knew him. Mm -hmm. There, that kind of fear for your own safety stays with you. Uh, it, the thing that I've been grateful for this week, uh, more than anything, is that I had a mom who was in constant sort of emotional contact with her daughters. Uh, she talked to us about men. She talked to us about safety. She talked to us about how, and us, I mean, my two sisters and I, and there were no sons in her family. Um, she talked to us about how it is not your fault, how what men do and how men mistreat women is not never your fault, that you do not have to take responsibility for the for the uh, harassment, whatever the misbehavior is. And, and I'm, I realize I'm using that term very lightly, but I'm just going to say that whatever the uh, misbehavior is. You're not responsible for how they behave. Right. And so when I was a young teenager and uh, a man who was not, I was not in day-to-day contact with, I could avoid easily. I've, I've talked about this before. He was not somebody that was in authority over me. Uh, but when he touched me inappropriately, I was able to walk away from that, never, never be in contact with him again, and also not blame myself. And so that um, ameliorated the trauma, I think, for me quite a bit in that I didn't, I wasn't ashamed. I wasn't, uh, I, I, would, I don't want to say I wasn't traumatized because being touched that way is traumatizing. Mm-hmm. But it, I didn't carry some sort of tremendous scar with me because I knew not to blame myself or to hide in shame about it. Uh, I didn't tell my parents about it. Uh, I just knew I was never going to be in contact with that person again. I was never going to be in any situation where I was phys- in physical proximity to that person. And I made that choice and that gave me a lot of power over the situation. Uh, and I didn't report him because I was a child. I was literally a child. So uh, looking back, if I had been able to change something about that, I would have told someone, but I didn't. So I, but I see in Christine Ford, you know, if, if I knew this person was going to be appointed to the Supreme Court, yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a child molester, right. you know, right. hello, I'm going to come out and say so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and if you have, haven't seen it yet, um, it's gone up at Crooks and Liars, what Lady Gaga said last night to Stephen Colbert about her surviving sexual assault 
and what triggering is and how you you put feelings and you put discussions, you put issues in a box, you put what happened to you in a box because opening that box is physically painful. And so uh, you keep it in a box and you keep it to protect yourself. You keep it sealed up. But there is a triggering that goes on when the person who did that to you is going to be pointed to a lifetime appointment uh, to the highest level of judicial power in the country. And that triggers you to, to open that box, no matter how painful it is, for the good of the country. And it's very powerful. Her, she says it in such a brief, concise way. Uh, it's very moving, and I highly recommend you see it. Um, and the, one last thing. The lasting impact on this Axios article, um, women are indelibly changed by attacks that men don't deem significant enough to remember, let alone apologize for. That's the power dynamic we're dealing with. Uh, and then this 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 part in it, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this part in it that really uh, addressed my issue. Um, power here is recognizing that it isn't the woman's fault. Sexual assault is not the is not the victim's fault, and if you have that in your psyche and in your your mental energy, you're able to overcome it. I think much more easily. Um, so I'm very grateful to my mom. She's gone now, but I'm very grateful that she empowered me in that way, even back in the seventies. So Con controlling the narrative mm -hmm. is power. Yeah, deciding who gets to be believed and who doesn't get to be believed, and mm -hmm. what about what's valid and what's invalid and what's what's dispositive and what's not mm -hmm. um, is it really is that's how you control the past mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. i mean you everybody has had trauma i know i have uh not of this kind but you know doing really stupid shit when i was younger nearly dying a few times getting the shit beat out of me taking the guy to court losing because he was the son of a cop um yeah. and when i think back about those things i realize a shit that was a long time ago <laughs> Yeah, and right. Me, I remember a perfectly framed portrait of the moment when it became clear that I was in real trouble, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I could die doing this. Mm -hmm. But I don't mm -hmm. remember every event leading up to it. Right. I sure should don't remember everything after it. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. moment, that little diorama of the, the trauma is, is chemically etched in my brain forever. Mm -hmm. Same thing. There's a movie of it in your head. Yeah. Yep. And yep. it jumps right back to you across the decades immediately and clearly um, for everyone. This is how mm -hmm. people remember things. This is why people keep diaries because, you know, right. we, you and I teach a journaling class from time to time. And it, it is remarkable when you go back, all the things that your brain just sorts out because it's no longer useful or it's too painful or it's not worth remembering or it's repetitive. Um, and that's just how your memory works. Mm -hmm. And, and I watched someone recover not in the not in the hypnotic psychological sense but i watched someone bring out an incredibly vivid painful crystal clear memory of a specific incident and share it with a bunch of people who were trying to hurt her yeah and the reaction from the republican party um everyone deserves to burn in hell starting mm -hmm. with donald trump starting with mocking this woman in front of his, one of his lynch mobs yeah um, it's it, it is intolerable that these people are still in charge of anything, much yeah. less damn near in charge of everything. And I blame every single person who empowered these people for the last thirty years. Yeah. Um, I I I think maybe at, towards the end here we'll talk about never Trumpers again. Okay. But um, what would you like to talk about? Well, I just. The the one last thing about the Axios article uh, talked about a fear that sexual assault is becoming a partisan issue, mm -hmm. that Democrats are on one side believing the woman and Republicans are on the other side of this, uh, at best arguing for due process, at worst just disbelieving women as hysterical and liars. What we call uh, Brett Stevensing, right? <laughs> yeah. But look. Uh, as I as I tweeted this morning, if o it is only becoming a partisan issue if one side insists that what has been normal for decades must remain normal, and that is the that is the argument we are having across the political spectrum about race, about gender, about sexual orientation, about economies, all of it. 
One side is insisting that what has been normal for decades must remain normal, and they are going to lose that battle. And and they're the ones who are radically advantaged by the status quo remaining untouched. Right. Always. And, I mean, but, but so- have you noticed, have you, did you see that picture of, I mean, to me, it, it really stood out as one of those pictures that's going to be in the history books 30 years from now. Picture of Mitch McConnell with his caucus behind him. Yes. And it is all white haired white men. Just with, except for Mike Lee from Utah. He was the token young person, quote unquote. Uh Uh, There, there is such a dividing line right now uh, in our politics of white Republican men versus the world. Yeah. And they've got them. The the idea that uh, Chuck Grassley goes on the floor of the Senate today and starts talking about the dark money of the left, yeah. While you know he he's on yeah, we were, he's le- we were talking about he he's not billing this to uh, the Heritage Foundation or the Koch yeah. brothers, right? <laughs> I don't want Heritage? I gotta go on the floor and talk some shit about people. This, now, I'm not on the clock now. Take me off the clock. <laughs> And then he goes off and blasts, you know, the the crisis acting Soros hungry libtards for all of their terrible <laughs> sins against this great good man here, uh, and then wanders back to his office for pudding and more, um, setting up his next life as a as a lobbyist. Yeah, uh, I I don't know or care if Chuck Grassley believes any of this shit. I thought it was perfectly hysterical that uh, Chuck Grassley formulated his opinion about who was right and who was wrong um, using the following phrase. I've heard so many people believe that I tend to believe it. He said, if he believes that the George Soros is paying the elevator protesters. Now think about the construction of this sentence by the guy who's leading the um, Ram Kavanaugh through at all costs right. and blow off Dr. Ford. First of all, he is apparently very good friends with Donald Trump's best friend, Manny people. Right. Many people is no is everywhere. This guy's like fucking zealot. He's everywhere. And everybody knows him on the right. And everyone thinks that that he's giving them great advice. Secondly, sure, many people should many people should be believed. And therefore, he tends to believe it, except, of course, when you're talking about sexual abuse survivors, because those people, as we all know, are flighty, extreme, liberal, Clinton stooging, Soros, dark money funded crisis actors uh, who can never be believed. So the it's this it's not that they're evil which they are it's they're so stupid it's the, it formulating that argument in that way actually if we lived in a world where hypocrisy is fatal you would have seen him go up in a in a in a burst of flames because you just handed the argument that if a bunch of people believe something I should believe it too you just handed the entire Senate over to the Democrats yep but. You clearly don't believe that. You just believe in saying whatever shit you got to say to get through the day so that you can get your guy on the court so that Donald Trump will quit calling you at home and threatening your children, you know, what, or whatever the hell he, hold he has over you. And these people are are really clinging to their privilege uh, with their fingernails. And, and that's the problem. They don't care about the future at all. They don't care about your kids. They don't care about our kids. They don't care about tomorrow at all. These are almost entirely bitter, bigoted old men who just want to make a shitload of money and go to their grave in comfort. And that's what they, then they got Trump now. So, well, shit, this is what we're going to do. This is the horse we're going to ride. So we're going to ride it all the way. And that's where, and that's what we're looking at today. That's what we're looking at in the Congress. We're looking at Susan Collins walking around, you know, I, I, she's in the middle of some goddamn speech now telling us all about her thoughts and her what a great senator and, she is yeah she's talking about what a great senator she is and that, that and I, I can't yeah. watch it no no i really i can't it's not that i can't watch terrible people being terrible it's that it's so redundant and boring i know the argument they're going to make they always make it it's mm-hmm. a stupid argument every yeah. argument they make is predictable and dumb and laughable and ridiculous except for the fact that they have trained 60 million americans like seals as i say reprogrammable meat bags Mm -hmm. and all of the things coming out of chuck grassley's mouth and donald trump's mouth and 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 every one of them is specifically targeted to get those people not to not to bolt (laughs) to tell those people we got your we got you covered man these uppity broads 
these these dark people, these liberals, they're not going to take shit from. They're not going to take anything from you. You still rule the world, man. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll make sure that you get to continue to rule the world. And that's the bargain they've made. And they're very public about it. They're very open about it. Yeah, we're a racist party. Yeah, we're misogynists. Yeah, we hate the rest of the world. But fuck you. You know, we won. So suck it. And and that's why this election is really goddamn important. Um, I also mentioned that last week, at least, that this this period of time has been a bumper crop in both siderism. Oh yeah. Uh it it, it has it has just been blossoming in every direction, except in some cases it's not. Um it's it's just been very weird to watch. Uh today, literally today, as I am speaking, uh Dave Brooks uh has come off of his 10 week book leave. David Brooks. Yeah. I uh I don't have a book. Therefore, I don't have book leave. I also don't work for the New York Times, so I don't have anyone paying me to go on book leave. But he came off of his um, 10-week book tour and book leave where he's working on his next book, uh, where he was out for 10 weeks scolding Americans for disappointing him terribly, uh, to come back to America and his column and explain that both sides are terrible. Yep. Um, And I wrote a really long post about it today, and I won't bore you with it now, but suffice it to say... I went back to I, I I played little tricky things. I did a tricky trick thing there, Blue Gal. I went yeah. back to 2005 and found his shitty article about the Supreme Court from the middle of the Bush administration. Oh wow! And then just wrote it up like this is what he wrote today, and there yeah. was no way to tell the difference. No uh, daylight was, between the two. Yeah, unless you were yeah. following the real specifics, like why is he talking about Harry Blackman? Why is he? But unless you were really re- closely reading it, you could not tell. And it was all the same. Oh, the you know the and it was the in his in this case it was um, Roe versus Wade was decided horribly. Um, liberals overreached. That's why conservatives lost their mind. And really, the only thing to do to bring this country back to sanity, let the let the let the centrist, the reasonable centrist majority in this country, you know, govern clearly and correctly, is to is to finally overturn Roe versus Wade. Yep. Yeah. The arguments he was making back then, and I trace it to a very specific moment in time. That was the collapse of the Bush administration. As the Bush administration fell apart, all of these assholes needed a place to go. Because su- suddenly saying that liberals are stupid and wrong and George Bush was a genius wasn't working anymore. <laughs> so that's when they invented the high and holy church of both sides do it. Yeah. And suddenly this was the state religion in the beltway. And this was 13 years ago that David Brooks was making this argument. And every, I, I would argue, virtually every single one of his fucking columns since has been a slight tweak a very tiny iteration of the same both sides do a lie that's why he's paid a shitload of money from the new york times to tell this lie over and over again just bludgeon it into the beltway consciousness chuck todd does it the entire uh half the people at msnbc do it everybody at cnn the the whole universe fell in behind david brooks because they didn't want to be held accountable for all the horrible shit they did during george bush so they said hey you know what let's blame everybody because if everybody's to blame then no one's to blame and here we are 13 years later, and David Brooks is making exactly the same argument. What has changed is a whole bunch of his running buddies are now choking on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he came. He comes wandering back from the countryside saying, isn't it a shame how both sides are terrible? It's the worst thing that's ever happened in America. Oh, the poison. Oh, my God. What are we going to do? Except now you have people like Jennifer Rubin saying, yeah, not really. <laughs> no, nah, not so much. Uh, no, this is pretty much the entire Republican Party is the problem. Max Boot, who I have a real serious problem with for a whole bunch of reasons, starting with the Iraq War and ending basically yesterday, uh, is one of those never Trumpers who had had a come to Jesus moment five minutes ago, and he too has a book to sell, and he too has discovered that oh my God, the Republican Party is full of Republicans, yeah. and now he's writing, we need to destroy the Republican Party. It's not both sides. The GOP is racist. The Iraq War was wrong. Blah 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 blah. Um, even even. Tom, uh, even even David Brooks's close personal pod, you know, twin brother, <laughs> brother from another mother, Tom Friedman. Can you believe this column? Tom, the 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 Tom Friedman, with whom David Brooks has shared many many an horrible horrible panel, yeah. <laughs> in which they both said it's a shame that both sides are terrible. We need a third party. Tom Friedman has finally decided the only way off of this sinking ship is by shoving his ass onto my lifeboat and saying, it would be easy to blame both sides equally for this shift, noted Ornstein, but it's just not true. Yeah, he quoted Ornstein and Mann, 
who in who 2012 were? were banned from the Sunday shows for saying, for saying this is the Republicans' problem. Exactly this shit. And you know who? You know how I know that? Because my beautiful wife forwarded me a column today from the aforementioned Jennifer Rubin. Yes, said, from 2012. What? From 2012, yeah. right? Not from 18 2012. <laughs> from 2012, yeah. saying. Nor Ornstein and Man are a bunch of idiots. They're crazy. They're crazy talking about it being the the right. It's not the right. It's Barack Obama, and he won't pass. Uh, what what the fuck was it? He wouldn't. He, pass? he wouldn't. He wouldn't look at grand bargain. Yes, he wouldn't pass the grand bargain. <laughs> oh my god, the, the goddamn partisans on the left are ruining this country. Mm-hmm. Ornstein and Man saying it's the it's the right who's doing this shit. That's crazy talk. Jump ahead six years. Yeah, <laughs> Jennifer Rubin's now. You know what? The Republican Party is a bunch of fucking crazy racist assholes, and I am really, really sorry. I didn't notice it before now. And I'm just thinking, maybe we just need a bigger bat. Yeah. Well, at least Jennifer Rubin is telling people to vote for Democrats. She's not she sugarcoating is. it. She is. She's not saying, she oh, uh, I'm an independent now. The no. Republican Party left me. I don't know what happened. That's Jim Scarborough's well, line. At, right? at the end, I, I will say at the end of Tom Friedman's column, it's what we need is a coalition of the center, left and the center, right. Yeah. Like, of course <laughs> you would say that, you fucking <laughs> asshole. But but because Donald Trump grabbed you by your privileged, billionaire, lazy fucking balls and squeezed them so hard, you finally had to say, it's not both sides, okay? Yeah. I swear, I was, it's not both sides. And that must have killed him to write that. Well, because- and, and I got to say, I loved your I loved your post on Tom Friedman most of all. It was my favorite post of the week because um, <laughs> you had fun writing it. It's very literary. It's a story of it's how story. Tom Friedman gets on the lifeboat and says to everyone else trying to get on luggage first. <laughs> and he carries luggage on first? all of his luggage columns first? about cab drivers. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, he, he has his bearer. Uh, carry him to the life. He has to. He has, he has to the miss the stop. cheese. The cheese. Uh, horse, the cheese horse, right? The cheese because the ship's going down. <laughs> he's he's appalled, and he, and he suddenly notices all this people floating by dead in the water. And we and the first set of lifeboats he goes to is the a third party will save us lifeboats. Yes. But those have all been uh, lowered into the water and sunk mm-hmm. because you know Bill and I put a little video of Bill Crystal saying, "You know who's going to save us? David French. I found this third party <laughs> guy. He's going to kick ass." <laughs> Yeah, well, fuck you. I guess that didn't work out. So now Bill Crystal wants on my fucking lifeboat. You know what? None of you fuckers get on my lifeboat. No, none of you. None of you. A, and this is true of Max Boot, too. Max, you know, that's great. You had your little revelation, and you suddenly realized that the Republican Party is full of Republicans. But when you start adding up that Joe Scarborough and Max Boot and David Brooks and David Frum and Bill Crystal and Matthew Continetti, who's his son-in-law, and Jennifer Rubin and Kathleen Parker, and on, it's a fucking huge list. Yep. When you add them all up, no one in the Republican Party knew what was going on inside the Republican Party. Yeah, right. That's their alibi. Yeah. Not a single fucking person in a position of authority or power or, or spokesmanship or or had any control over the party or, or or wrote white papers for the party or punditing for the party. Not one of them, apparently, this is their solid alibi across the board. Not one of them had any idea what was going on inside the Republican right. Party. Or, or, I or the, party the voters that they were actually appealing to. They had no idea what those people were actually like. Right. Yes, except Rick Wilson made his money tinkering together ads specifically to drive racist assholes to the polls. Right. And so the idea that – and which leaves me with the great existential question that no one is ever going to ask them because right now Max Boot is on Anna Marie Cox's podcast. He's being fluffed by David Korn uh, in Mother Jones. Uh, Rick Wilson is making the rounds, and no one, to my knowledge, has ever asked them the simple question, did you not know, in which case, since that was your only goddamn job, why should anyone listen to anything you have to say now? Because you're obviously completely clueless and not very bright. Or were you lying the whole time? But class, case- that requires a journey into the past, and that is a place where only liberals are able to tread, apparently. Well, I, I'd like to correct you in one small way, yeah. and, and that is... Uh, uh, Matthew Dowd mm-hmm. is now making a very big deal that you know what I've been against this whole both sides set for years. Yeah, a couple years, years now. A couple years now. <laughs> imagine, imagine him saying this in the Barney Fife voice. You know, I've been against this whole thing for a long time. This whole, you know, the news isn't, shouldn't be about balance. You know, Barn, and, you know, Andy, bad news should be about the truth, not about balance. You know, this whole false equivalence thing. I've been against it for years. Yeah, I'm like asshole. Look behind you. There is a truckload 
of of your own tweets and your own articles where you are the champion of this until about a year and a half ago, in which case your world got turned upside down. Then you were apologizing to no one. Then you were saying, well, let's give Donald Trump a chance. And then it was, let's not hold people's past against them. Now it's, you know, for many, many years, I've been a complete champion of, of, of taking down this whole false equivalency nonsense. Yep. And, and like, I, I pointed out to him that I'm sure he was one of the team that banned Ornstein and Mann from the Sunday shows. Oh, well, he certainly banned me. Yep. I mean, uh, the reason this asshole blocked me, because let's, let's, Matthew Dowd's job title is um, ABC News Chief Political Analyst. Right. And, and apparently he sucks at the news part and the political part. <laughs> And the analyst part. So I have no idea what his job is other than sitting on a panel <laughs> waving in the breeze. Whichever way the wind's blowing, that's where Matthew Dowd is headed. All right. But Drift class, I, I got to this... talk you down from the ledge now because we're at 40 minutes. <laughs> Holy crap. Blue gal, shut me the hell up and move on. All I know is this, that Matthew Dowd 2018 blocked me. Yes. In 2016 for saying shit that Matthew Dowd 2018 now swears he believed all along. <laughs> And that, that, and that son of a bitch is still ABC News chief political analyst. Wow. Uh, there's a successful fundraiser going on, Drift Glass. It is the oh, no. crowdfunding campaign for Susan Collins' as yet unannounced opponent. <laughs> <laughs> they are now over $2 million. Oh, that's 50,000 50, people have donated $20.20 to defeat Susan Collins. Uh this may well be her retirement speech. I don't know. It's not over yet as, as of this recording. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, she, there's going to be a whole lot of interest in making sure she's defeated. Wow. You won't have Susan Collins kick around. Like that, <laughs> well, I'm sure she'll find a job as a lobbyist someplace, but uh, yeah. Um, in any event, uh, she, the, the, people are, are very focused on getting her out of office. Uh Drift class, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the EPA relaxing radiation okay. exposure guidelines. Uh, I would like to mention one thing before we move on to the news. Yeah. And just a funny story. It's a funny story. It's a happy, feel good story, Blue Gal. Yeah. Uh, a disgruntled former Washington Post employee <laughs> is trying to get the Washington Post to relabel Jennifer Rubin as a dirty, dirty hippie and to hire some real There's conservatives. There's a whole letter going out from quote unquote yeah. real conservatives like Michelle Malkin. Yeah. And what they really want is something I've talked about before. They want 21% of the voters to have 50% of the editorial page at the Washington yes, Post. And, and here's the part that's funny and feel good. And just, you know, you just want to relax with a beer with this kind of post. <laughs> um, the disgruntled former Washington Post employee who is spearheading this is a guy named Ben Dominich, mm -hmm. uh, who runs a site, a shitty, shitty, awful pro-Trump site called The Federalist. Uh, ben, who married into the McCain family, who's now uh, Mr. Megan McCain. Uh, ben has a history with Washington Post in that they fired him three days after they hired him because he was a plagiarist. Yeah. So yeah. it is, and, and this is the thing that, that you really do need to know. Ben would have gone away forever. He was, you know, he was a right-wing guy. He, he was a book editor at Regnery Press. He edited Hugh Hewitt's book. He edited Michelle Malkin's book. He was doing all the sort of small beer shit that, that conservatives do to suck enough dick to get to the point where you get to go on TV. And then he hit the Washington Post and three days into his gig there, they cashiered him for being a plagiarist. And he did a bunch of other skeezy shit. Now, he would have gone away forever. Ben would never be a threat. He would ne he'd never made it to ABC News as a regular. He never would have been uh, an, an A-lister on the Sunday shows. He certainly never would have had the firepower to, to, to sort of must try to muscle the Washington Post. But for one thing, his very good friend Chris Hayes and his very good friend Ezra Klein on MSNBC kept putting this son of a bitch on the air for reasons that I think I understand. Because they're bros, man. He's yeah. my good friend. He, no, your good friend's a fucking Nazi, man. And if you didn't see that coming a mile down Michigan Avenue, then maybe your perception filter needs adjusting. Maybe you're not the guy who should be picking winners and losers when it comes to booking them on your show. So now we've had uh, the, the drift glass grievance hour against all these men in media. Yeah. I want... I want folks to know that drift glass is getting along very well he does play well with others I do. <laughs> and you've been having a really nice conversation back and forth this week with jay rosen i have i have we we uh both media we're both media titans in our own way <laughs> uh jay has a long history of teaching uh journalism uh he has a long history i have a long history of, of 
of tearing my newspaper apart. Bashing journalists, at, so-called journalists. Yeah, yeah. And screaming at my TV <laughs> and, and basically pissing into the abyss and nothing ever happened. But we both um, came to an agreement that fear of basically insolvency mm -hmm. is what's holding a lot of newspapers hostage. Yeah. It's certainly true in, in my local paper. Yeah. Uh, it is categorically the case that if my local paper stopped carrying Ann Coulter and Mark Thiessen, and probably enough subscribers would quit to bankrupt the paper mm -hmm. or at least make them cut back from seven reporters to four or three or two. And it would be literally a, a, a mimeographed sheet of rip and read shit from the AP right. plus a bunch of ads. Right. Um, and that's 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 the economic truth behind it. They can't say that because they have to keep saying it's about the First Amendment and make sure everybody has a voice and blah, 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 blah. Except they cut out all the conservatives who freaked out when Donald Trump became president right this is, this is really a discrimination against never trumpers i i hate to say that but they've had to say no on the right we will have pro-trump on the left right. we will have anti-trump and that will be it because that's all we have space for which again 21 percent of the voters are getting 50 percent of the editorial page of our paper mm -hmm. in the form of and coulter columns yes across the country a across, across the, country. the country and that's right. a real big problem anyway that's a really big problem I'm off the ledge now. Off the ledge. Off the ledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's do a quick yeah. news roundup, shall we? And I, I'm going to sure. start. I, I'm, I'm moving forward because I think this is really important. Uh, yeah. it, it is. There is just a collapse of standards of science and standards of medicine and standards of education in this administration that is just unacceptable. The rollback of the Enlightenment. The, the really, rollback of the Enlightenment and the idea that the Environmental Protection Agency would relax radiation exposure guidelines. You know, let's bring lead back into gas as well while we're at it, right? It well, and, and because radiation might be good for you. You don't know. It's not, you know, look, honey, let me explain. Radiation goes in, radiation comes out. Nobody you can't explain that. that. Right. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that got put at the top. Let's not forget that uh, there is a Clinton plot to get rid of Kavanaugh, right? right? And yes, last week, now we learned the extent of the plot. Last week, it was just just the Jesuit Review, the Dean of the Yale Law School, the American Bar Association. But this week, the plot thickened. Mm -hmm. Because this week, it now includes 100,000 member churches, not members, not individual people, member churches of the National Council of Churches, uh, retired Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, 1,700 law professors, and a former Kavanaugh classmate at Yale and a partridge in a fucking pear tree, all of whom think and are willing to put on the record for the first time that this guy should be absolutely not right. put on the Supreme Court. And that will be ignored by every Republican. Susan Collins just announced yeah. she's going to vote yes. And that's that. Uh, the FBI so. investigation was a sham. You knew that. And and so, yeah, we're, sure. we're looking forward tomorrow to uh, 30 after 30 hours. They're going to have a vote. Uh, and uh, Brett Kavanaugh will probably go on the court. Uh, it, the only question, I guess, now is whether Vice President Pence will break the tie. Oh, I hope so. Uh, I do I, hope so. I hope so too. If it's good, um, if he's going to go in, I hope it's a tiebreaker from Pence, so that we really have everyone to blame yeah. for this. In, in addition to uh, mocking uh, Dr. Ford mm -hmm. as rallies, uh, Trump has also recently mocked Al Franken for folding like a, quote, wet rag and resigning follow, following multiple allegations of sexual misconduct. You're supposed because to deny, deny, deny. That's a, Everybody deny knows that. Yeah. Okay, so I got to the White House. I'm appointing perverts and weirdos and corrupt freaks to every part of the government. I kept a wife denied... beater on for extra months because yeah. I could. Yeah. Yeah. And I did it because I denied and denied and because I've got 60 million idiots who have been trained to kiss my ass when I tell them the right code words. They, it is, in a sense little science fiction university moment for you. Mm -hmm. Like the winter soldier. If you repeat the code words in the correct order to the reprogrammable meat bags, they will stand up and kill anything you tell them to kill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and they're brainwashed and they're brainwashed to that level because without the lies that they hold on to, their identity would collapse. So they're never going to let that happen. Donald Trump protects them, not from immigrants, not from foreigners, not from brown people. Donald Trump protects them from self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which terrifies them. And that's what his promise is. I will never force you to look in the mirror. And they're they're great with that. They love that. Anyway. Speaking of things that Donald Trump supporters don't care about, uh, the New York Times' huge story on Trump's exploitive use of tax schemes and fraud during the 1990s. Uh, also, that Trump lied about 
uh, that $1 million loan from his parents, he's been from his father. Uh, he got at least $413 million in today's dollars from his father's real estate empire, some of it by fraud, some of it by tax schemes, uh, some of it from earning it as a toddler. And, uh, you know, the Trump voter doesn't care if he stole from his dad. Uh, and he is pretending that this is all old news about the tax stuff. But the fact is, we haven't seen his tax returns. And when the House gets put into Democratic hands, uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of Democratic House members who are going to subpoena Donald Trump's tax returns. Yes, they will. And, and here's that'd the be a thing really good time for him to fake a heart attack and resign. <laughs> here's the thing I predict. Yep. Um, it, that might be a good idea. None of his supporters will care. In fact, they'll, they'll applaud him for it. You yep. know why? Yeah. Because cheating on your tax is sticking it to the man. Right, you right. Why to go down to you? Stuck it to the man. Well, you are the man. Yeah, but I stuck it to the man. Yeah, but your roads are falling apart. Yeah, but you stuck it to the man. And that's all these meatheads know. Yeah. So they're going to be thrilled that he screwed the government out of billions of dollars mm-hmm. because he stuck it to the man. Speaking of sticking it to the man, <laughs> Robert Mueller's team has radio interviews between Roger Stone and radio host Randy Credico, who Stone claimed was his back channel to WikiLeaks founder, Assange. And uh, the British government is going ahead with their prosecution of uh, Cambridge Analytica, Mm -hmm. and the trial starts January. A federal judge blocked the Trump administration from ending temporary protective status for more than 300,000 immigrants from El Salvador, Haiti, Nicaragua, and the Sudan, along with, I think it's 190,000 of their American-born children. Uh, It's kind of ridiculous, uh, as many things are. Uh, but but they have they get to stay. That's the point. They're also denying visas to unmarried same sex partners of foreign diplomats and foreign staff. Yep. And requiring a marriage uh, for them to stay. The problem is, in many of their home countries, they would be prosecuted for having a homosexual marriage, a gay marriage. Right. So there, and it's, this is this is uh, Steve Miller. Yeah. This is Steve Miller declaring war on the world in in the name of white men. White straight and, men. Uh, Straight, straight white Christian mm-hmm. men, and mm-hmm. this straight up, you know, calculated state, uh, in, including the hundreds of migrant children who were moved from shelters in various states to a tent city in West Texas in high summer. Yeah, uh, they were loaded onto buses in the middle of the night, and they were shipped off, taken out of private homes, and now they're in some place called Torrio, Texas. Because calculated sadism makes Republicans happy. And there was an article in Esquire about that that the cruelty is the product. That is why yes, they're is. doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why they're that's why they mock Dr. Ford at rallies, and they they get cheers and laughs over it because they like hurting people. Mm-hmm. This is these are the same people that were absolutely thrilled that Dick Cheney and George Bush were torturing people. Yeah. They like hurting people. They like because that's the only way they get the bile out of their system is by inflicting it on other people, especially people that they believe are inferior to them or might actually be superior to them. Which scares the shit out of them. One of the things that one of the things that you said to me this week was you compared me to Mr. Spock in Star Trek Two, the second mm-hmm. the Wrath of Khan movie where he walks into the radiation chamber yes. to save the every ship day. every day every working day. for Crooks and Liars. Uh, usually nine to two. Today it was seven to. I was up at seven a.m. writing. Uh, you know I have to really uh, bathe myself in this stuff. And I have a, uh, my fellow compatriots at Kirks and Liars are very supportive and everybody works really well together. I'm very grateful for them. But I have said to you and to them and to everybody who wants to hear how I, how I stay sane through this is I fill the schedule and I get out. And then right. I do postcards and knit prayer shawls and do things that will make a difference. I mean, I hope I'm making a difference at Kirks and Liars, but you can only be in that environment of hearing this stuff and writing about it for so long. And then you really have to detoxify. And the way I'm doing that is postcards to voters. And I've done 50 so far um, postcards to voters, and I'm going to do 50 more. That's my goal (laughs) before election day is to get 50 more out and try to change this. And, and the road is long. There are, uh, pollsters and academic types now writing articles in the website called The Conversation saying, you know, Beto O'Rourke might not win. It's just not quite there where um, the Texas demography has changed enough to make it possible for him to win. 
Uh, he's yeah. getting big crowds. He's getting lots of enthusiasm and so forth. That doesn't get people to the polls. And and we have to prepare ourselves for several more losses before demography catches up and millennials and young people and Hispanics. And, you know, we're, we're making huge strides with women this week, I can tell yes, you. But yes, that doesn't get butts to the polls. And I don't know how we do that beyond, I mean, I was looking at Beto O'Rourke's college campus crowds and they're enormous. And I'm, I just want to be right there next to Beto who's being so positive. And so we're all in this together and just say, listen, fuckers, (laughs) (laughs) you just got out of your dorm and came over to your on-campus auditorium. And after this, you're going to go to your on-campus lunchroom and eat all unlimited salad bar and pizza and tonight have a beer and everything's great. If you don't get your fucking ass to the polls, you're going to have eight more years, six more years of Ted Cruz. And, and I can't um, stop that from where I'm sitting. Well, you know, you have an eldest child mm-hmm. who calls you with poll Yes, <laughs> every five minutes. <laughs> every five <laughs> That's minutes. That's his obsessive interest, but, you know, he's, he's got a problem, have, okay? <laughs> That's his you, have, you have a youngest child. <laughs> Who says, Mom, these people are brainwashed. Yes, I do. <laughs> and you have a middle child who last week or the week before stood up at, at her government group and told the mayor's representative that, get off your ass. People. <laughs> she pretty much did. She said, if you don't provide she, opportunities for young people, you're going to lose all of us. They, yes. They're going to lose all. So, uh, and you're doing postcards. Yep. Um, I'm knocking doors and just, just geographically or topographically. I do my, since I'm, you know, underemployed uh, a lot, um, I do my little writing shtick and my, 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 uh, my blog and my, et cetera, maybe 20 feet away from mm-hmm. me. So I, I am up to this, in, to my, to my belly. I can stop. I don't work for Crooks and Liars. So I don't have to wade up to my chin. I can pick my own posts. I can pick my own topics. Occasionally, like every hour or two, I walk in and say, here's a, here's some content if you need mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. but that's it that's that's my, the extent of it but it it really really matters that you um not you personally because you're doing everything humanly possible if you're doing this all the time if you have no ballast in your system then mm-hmm. every loss will knock you over and remember back when donald trump won and we said this is going to get worse before it gets better today is one of those worst days last week was one of those worst days watching susan collins and joe manchin say yeah i'm gonna vote for him is one of those worst days and knowing the number of people who are hurt gratuitously, uh, deliberately sadistically by horrible, horrible, shitty people that our neighbors voted for Mm -hmm. and love and think they're doing a great job hurts every goddamn day to do this. We went to the young Democrats last week. We did. And, and we should mention, uh, the two speeches that we heard, the three speeches that we heard at the young Democrats forum, uh, Sue Shearer, who yep. is a uh, state repre- state senator, state representative, state, state representative. representative. I think, I think. And she talked, she really gave a barn burner yep. uh, pep rally speech about yep. knocking on doors and how she was out knocking on doors. Um, she's around 60 years old. Mm-hmm. And she said, nice I went, white lady. nice white lady who's about 60 years old, state rep. And she said, I went and knocked on doors and knocked, on the doors of two bedroom bungalows in a house very much like my own. A woman comes to the door who's a 60 year old white woman, very much like myself. And I do my spiel. And she says, Oh no, I can't stand the way me, the media is treating Donald Trump. And so I'm going to vote state straight Republican ticket. And she said, I went to three houses like that in one day and do not think that democratic enthusiasm is going to win elections. It's no, not. Who like <laughs> takes movement. votes that will win Democratic elections? <laughs> and that mm-hmm. getting votes takes work. So this is just like youngest child studying her vocabulary. It takes work. You can't just be charming and have enthusiasm. It takes work. It takes doing postcards. It takes making phone calls. It takes knocking on doors. It takes volunteering. And if you can't get out of your house, it takes d- the postcards you can do from home. And uh, it's not hard. And you, there's all kinds of instructions. Go look up uh, hashtag postcards to voters on Twitter. You'll find it. Uh, and on Facebook as well. They're on Facebook as well. Uh, and then um, I want you to talk about the keynote speaker. 
But yeah. uh, guy the, named Christian Mitchell. Yep. Uh, he's in Illinois House of Representatives, and he represents the 26th district. And he brought the shit, man. He did. <laughs> he did. He he clearly. This is a, a young African American gentleman, somewhere in his 30s. A uh, dynamic speaker, very very connected. He knows can, knows what audience he's speaking to. Uh, was willing to sort of and and was loose speaking. Could could riff and improv and say, you know, this is supposed to be a pancake breakfast. I don't see any goddamn pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is yeah. why we lose elections. Um, <laughs> uh, but was willing to stand up and, and use language because clearly his role model, and I think everyone's role model running for office, frankly, is, is Barack Obama. Yeah. yeah. Um, he is a, a, a he is a rising star in the Illinois Democratic Party and will be a rising star in the National Party if there's any justice in the world. Yeah. Uh, but he did things uh, with a different inflection than Obama did. Obama was all about purple states and we're all one country, et cetera. And Mr. Mitchell was willing to say, Republicans are fucking cowards. Yep. Um, yep. Republicans are liars. They're, they they do terrible things on purpose because that's who they are. And we need to k- basically kick their ass. And he was very clear about what it takes to do that, how we do that. And then he, and, and at the beginning of a speech, he said, I, I told, uh, um, the whoever was was emceeing this this terrible thing. I forgot the MC, but I forgot. I, did, I remembered him. Uh, I was supposed to stand up here and give a 20, 20 or 30 minute speech. Um, and I'm, I'm working on legislation that will make it a uh, compulsory death penalty for anyone who speaks for more than 12 minutes during a breakfast speech. Ha 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 ha. And he, yeah. looked, he said, he said, I'm just kidding. Why yeah, are, I just made all the death, death penalty activists yeah. in the room yeah. really I'm really sorry. I'm just kidding. He said, I believe in due process. Pause for me. <laughs> Unlike some people we know. Ha 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 ha. But this is a guy who who is um as as um as Toby would say in the West Wing, is good for all time zones. Yeah. You can put him checks anywhere. off lots of boxes, but yep. can speak to a white suburban audience as well yes. as a black church and audience. can talk yep. on any subject. Yeah. can talk very, right very across smart. the Democratic. This is the, when when people are saying, you know, yeah, you focus on Trump and the and then and why aren't you focusing on Donald? Why are you obsessing with Donald Trump? Morning Joe, you know, who never leaves their bubble. Right. No. Down here in the weeds, people like this are talking about labor, education, infrastructure, and number one with a bullet. Healthcare. Yep. That's what they're talking about. And Donald Trump comes up because he and his party are against all of it, but it comes up incidentally, not directly. And although Donald Trump is definitely on the ballot, which everyone acknowledges, it's the issues and where Democrats stand on the issues and the ability to articulate them clearly and succinctly and reach an audience with them on a personal level that's going to move voters. And this guy's very good at that. And, uh, the the other speaker there was Andy Menar, who is yeah. also a rising star in the Illinois Democratic Party. Uh, seems very content with where he is at the moment, but yeah. uh, and I think because he's not a trillionaire, <laughs> can't yeah, run for governor. Problem. That's the problem: is that he can't he can't be in a normal political environment where you just raise money from small donors and run for governor. He yeah. would be running for governor. But well, here's, uh, here's what I would say, mm-hmm. um, and this is an Illinois bias. Um, Andy Menard would be our next Dick Durbin. Yeah, he's from downstate, Christian, like Dick Durbin. And Christian right. Mitchell would be our next Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah. Because it, they yeah. just he has a very, you know, Midwest farmer. Yeah, uh, went to school. He here, is from vibe. downstate, right? Yeah, yeah. And and the thing is, the, the thing they bragged about the two of them uh, was that they had co-sponsored the most legislation that Governor Rauner had signed. And the most legislation that Governor Rauner had vetoed. <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah. And they work together. This is a Chicago African-American, as a, as you said, very well-spoken, very smart guy who just knows politics and knows how to do politics. Yeah. And Andy Menar, who is uh, committed to his district so strongly and raises money for education for his district – and he's a state senator, and he is very committed to his district and does good progressive things. But the reason he keeps getting reelected to the state senate in farm country is, and as, as a Democrat, is because he keeps bringing it home to his district. Yes, he does. He does. And, and he's the guy who got through funding yep. for schools. Down, when down state everyone schools. said it was impossible right. to do. It could right. not be done. He really did do it. He worked, and he worked, and he worked, and, and he, and he, he got— 
the Rauner veto overridden in right. in the state house and the state senate to and fund that was two education. Other old school, right. shaking hands, working deals, cutting compromises, politics. Yep. Yep. Of the old school. But and here, he, here's what I, we thought was so funny about Andy Menard. Uh, Andy Menard told a story about his opponent. And he said, do you, you know who my opponent is? And he said, no, no. He said, I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you his yeah. name because you don't yeah. need to know. <laughs> but but his opponent skipped a League of Women Voters forum that Andy right. Menard was there. Right. And yeah. he just skipped it. Blew it off. Blew it, it off. Was invited. Blew it off. Invited. Blew it off. And the next day... Uh, went before the microphones and demanded that Andy Menard debate him in all five counties I in the district. I dare you raise to my challenge, Andy Menard. All five counties. I will challenge you in all five counties of our district. There are Man, six the counties in the district. Six. 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 <laughs> six. And this came up this week. Andy Menard actually <laughs> liked my tweet because yeah. I tweeted this story when I retweeted Mike Levin, who is running in the uh, California 49th district which is Orange County and San Diego. Uh, that is uh, a Republican district, and it's open. It's, um, it's what's his name from the Benghazi hearing, the, the car stealer? Isa. Darryl yeah, Daryl Isa's old district, okay? And Daryl Isa's leaving. Mike Levin is running as a Democrat from the California 49th, and his Republican opponent said, you know, if Democrats flip the House, it'll be like California all over the nation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Dude, you're standing in California right now. You're trying to represent you're... California in the House of Representatives. I'm proud to be a Californian. I don't know. What is your problem? Dude, you're soaking in it. <laughs> and it's like, what? That's, that's the only place in California where he could get away with. I bet heard from other Californians that that's the only place in California where he could get away with saying that. Because people, the Republicans in Orange County think the whole of California is just a socialist nightmare, but they're not going to move, a, right? It's a madhouse. <laughs> it's a madhouse. And, but now here's here's the button on this. Here's the punchline. Mm -hmm. At the end of this, because we kept saying, you know, we should leave. Uh, we, we got there. We were seated in the back where the losers sit. And then one of our winner friends said, hey, come sit with us. So we got to sit with the winners, which is great. Hi, he listens to the podcast, too. Yeah, he does. We have, <laughs> we have podcast fans. And we passed out our business cards and said, professional left. We've been around for 72 years. No one's heard of us. Hey, how about you help us? And and they all asked, can you get me John Lovett's autograph? And I said, no, no, I really, really can't do that. John Lovett doesn't know I exist. But anyway, the punchline to all of this is is simple. We kept saying we should leave now and it kept getting better and yeah. we stayed. Yeah. At the end, the they had a bunch of get out the vote packets. Yeah. And people were walked up to a table. Here's your map. Here's your list of names. Here's your script. We'd like you to go A, B, C, and D for a whole bunch of candidates, right. for a whole bunch of right. different things. Because there's a lot of overlapping get out the vote efforts going on between Pritzker mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Betsy Lonegren and a bunch. Every, everybody has their own team. And they're trying to sort of make sure they don't um, reinvent the wheel over and over right. again. Right. But that's what you do. You don't just get a crowd together to go, yay. You have to give them something to do. Mm -hmm. And what, to, what you do item. at the end right. of the rally right. is – is Barack Obama did this right. at the end of the rally? Go register, go register. The registration people right out there, go, 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 because none of it means anything if you don't go out and vote. None of it. And you and I will be sitting here crying in our beers about what the hell happened uh, in November. I don't want that to happen again. I want, even if we lose, even if it's not perfect, I want to believe that we have expended every effort. We've done everything possible to make sure that we win. That's all. Turn out Devin Nunes is. Family dairy farm in California was actually secretly lo relocated to Iowa yeah. more than 10 years ago and relies heavily on, wait for it, wait for it, the work of undocumented workers. Isn't that very exciting? Yep, yep. Oh, and by the way, they they appear, both Devin Nunez and Chuck Grassley, appear to be uh, applying for those Trump subsidies for their farm yeah. Yeah. because of, of yeah. <laughs> Because of, tariffs. because of the tariffs. I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. This is I'm laughing so hard. Last thing, I swear to God, last thing. Uh, Donald Trump, this is the week that Donald Trump changed the font mm -hmm. on the NAFTA agreement, which was the worst treaty in, in human history. And he changed it from Helvetica to Comic Sans. <laughs> and now it's the greatest <laughs> treaty in the history of fucking civilization. So uh, these postcards that I did for Postcards for Voters uh, this week were for Stacey Abrams. 
but also for her, her running mate, who is Sarah Riggs Amico. And the idea behind these postcards is to uh, pair these two women, make sure that name recognition for Sarah Riggs Amico is as high as it is for Stacey Abrams, because Stacey Abrams has gotten so much national media, and make sure that uh, down ballot people vote D all the way. And that's really important. Make sure your friends know, yes, it's important to vote for this particular candidate that's getting all this attention, whatever it is in your state, Senate or governor or whatever. By the same token, don't forget to vote for Democrats all the way down. And by the way, we still, yeah. in Sangamon County, have Republicans running unopposed. And I just left that blank. <laughs> yeah. I am not voting yes for a Republican, period, for the rest of my life. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Merlin. And in this picture, guess where Merlin is? He's sitting in the tubby. This tubby water is the best water. He's not sitting in the water, but you know those little drips that come out of the faucet? Lick, lick, lick. Those are so good. Those are medicinal. We have that, we have that here, too, believe it or not. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. A shout out to everybody who gives five bucks a month on PayPal. We appreciate you so much. Uh, pa PayPal or Patreon, five bucks a month. It makes a huge difference. Our hearts were broken for the Cubs this week, right? They were. Yeah. I, I used to live six blocks from Wrigley Field for a few years, uh, right next to the L tracks. And yeah. uh, other than the scent of urine in the air and the constant fight, I lived there during the fight over the lights, which were in the end ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's I've been to ball games at Wrigley Field many times. A friend of mine had has probably still season tickets there. And uh, uh, it's a delight. It's a wonderful park and a wonderful team. And I thoroughly enjoyed all of it. And it was sorry to see them lose, but see, here's the problem. You start setting expectations that you're going to win. For years, it was, oh, well, of course they're going to lose. And they started winning. It was a World Series. Yeah. And now people are expecting a higher level of performance for them, like the Democratic Party. <laughs> if you start <laughs> promising shit, you better deliver shit. Yeah. Or you end up in a wild yeah. card game and losing <laughs> the 13th inning. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Well, my parents lived, uh, you can see Steelers, the Steelers Stadium from the front stoop of their the place where they lived when my mom died. And uh, they were always praying for the Steelers to lose just because of parking. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? Like, That's a good point. That was also a very big issue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Drip Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are going to keep calling it NAFTA because fuck you, Donald Trump. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.